Lord, thank you for, for this day. Thank you for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for what we can learn from this uh, experience that Paul and Luke and others had. Thank you for what makes it relevant to today. And Lord, teach us about today through what they experienced. Only you can do that, and it's the power of your word. And so we truly expect revelation. And Lord, you said that uh, supernatural things follow your word and your message. So we expect that as well. So have your way here today. And we pray it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And Ashley has left the sanctuary. So. Um, I just changed the, the order at which I was going to do something. I'm going to start off here. So angels, the angel series, and Paul. Paul. Ooh, that looks like some stuff's in the water already. Wow. I don't know what that is. So, um, so this is it. I almost, um, if I'd wanted to take a lot of time with this, <laughs> some of you think, well, that's crazy. You already take a lot of time with this. But um, I've seen actual um, coming up on the Isle of Malta, they have found things that coincide with this story of them beaching themselves basically on Malta. And I thought about looking for those archaeological photographs that they've, they've found the stuff. Of course, it's stuff that's covered with barnacles and everything, but stuff that was discarded as they were casting themselves uh, toward the shore and everything. So, um, but, uh, but anyhow, I didn't do that. So there you go. Saved a little time. So our anchor scripture here, because we're doing angels, is uh, Acts 27, verse 23. This is the last time angels appear in the book of Acts, which is where we've been for a little while. Last night, an angel of the God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me. And that's Paul talking to the crew. And we'll be there momentarily. So uh, I, had, I had a lot of scripture in this one which I always do, but I had like twice as many scriptures as usual, and I had to start, I had to start cutting it down some. So, uh, so I'll skip around in Acts 27, but it'll all be in Acts 27. So uh, this is verse 1 and verse 3. This is the New International. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners, so I'll tell you a little bit about that, were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the imperial regiment. The next day we landed at Sidon and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. So just a little, a little backstory here. Paul is obviously um, incarcerated. Is that a good way to put it? He's incarcerated. He's, he's, he's in custody. And he has um, people who witnessed it. He he pled uh, for a audience with Caesar in the legal proceedings that were going on. And most people felt like that was unnecessary. That he would have been because uh, well, I won't even get into what was going on. But anyhow, he the the Lord has told him he's going to see Caesar. So he is incarcerated but he's incarcerated on a word from the Lord. What's actually happening is he's getting free passage to Caesar. <laughs> that's right. That's right. He's getting free passage. He's not got to pay nothing. He's just being taken there. And uh, as, we, as we go through this, you'll see it's starting off in Acts 27. It's, it's obvious that Paul is getting a lot of deferential treatment from Julius, the centurion. So there's already a favor that Paul has with the one in charge of him. Now, now there's other soldiers that, that uh, 
that Julius has with him. So there's a contingent of soldiers. Uh, the centurion who's in charge named Julius, which I don't know for sure, but, but there's a good chance he was named after Julius Caesar, you know, in all likelihood. Don't know that for sure. Julius means like soft-haired, so I don't know why you would name your child soft-haired unless there was a famous soft-haired person like Julius Caesar, you know, that you might say, uh, Julius. So um, he belonged to the Imperial Regiment. Some of your things may have Augustine or Augustus in there. It's, uh, some people want to say that that was some kind of special, like the Secret Service or something, but it's not. It's just, a, as far as I know, it's just a regular regiment. Uh, regiments tended to have names, and so there would be a lot that would have Imperial in the title or Augustine in the title. Um, so it starts off there. He's a prisoner, and notice it says that we would sail. If you go through uh, Acts, you'll see there are times that that it's told in third person and times it's told in, in uh, what would that be? The first person plural? Is it, what is that called? Dolores didn't hear the English teacher. But anyhow, uh, we. So that means in all likelihood that Luke has actually joined them on this, on this little adventure. And uh, so there are other prisoners involved too, but Paul's the chief one and he's on the way to see Caesar. And so uh, they land at Sidon. They left Caesarea, which we did a lot of stuff in Caesarea, and uh, landed at Sidon. And Julius very kindly letting Paul go see his friends, and uh, they're giving him stuff for his trip, probably, you know, a cheese ball and some crackers and, <laughs> you know, maybe a bottle of wine. I don't know. Some stuff, maybe biscuits, cheese biscuits, maybe. I'm on a cheese thing, I think, right now. Pimento cheese, maybe. I don't know. So, so anyhow, that's what's happening. And, <laughs> and that's not going to work. <laughs> I just picked up the wrong thing there. Let's see. So uh, skipping down to verses 6 and verse 9, uh, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship. Alexandria is in Africa. It was a chief city. In fact, uh, one of the things that is very unfortunate, but there's a cool, lot of cool things that took place in Alexandria. But Alexandria had the, the chief library in the world, and it burned to the ground. Um, and so, so there were a lot, of, a lot of things that were lost when that library in Alexandria uh, went down. But the ship, uh, there was a, a trade route, uh, with grain coming from Alexandria going to Rome. And so there's an Alexandrian ship, uh, Egyptian ship, sailing for Italy, sailing for Rome, and he put, he put them on board. Uh, much time had been lost. Sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them. <laughs> Paul the prisoner, right? Paul the prisoner is going to warn Let's see who he's going to warn. He's going to warn the owner of the ship. He's going to warn the captain of the ship. He's going to warn the centurion in charge of him. The prisoner, Paul, is going to warn them all. Uh, but notice this, that it's after the Day of Atonement, which means it's sometime uh, September, October. Uh, the, usually the rule of thumb for the Mediterranean was... It, you usually had fair sailing from Pentecost, which is usually May, June, through Day of Atonement. Well, actually, Tabernacles, so that was September, October. And, um, and after that, it got dicey. And especially, this is interesting because of the time, you, you know, the other day was Veterans Day, November 11th. Actually, November 11th was seen as the day that if you sail after November 11th, it was suicide. So it was just curious, you know, that we're hitting this uh, at that moment when that was thought. So Paul warns them. And the other thing about after the Day of Atonement, uh, again, who's writing this? Just real quick. Who's writing this? That's right. Luke, thank you. <laughs> 
I actually didn't hear anybody say Luke. I'm just going to go with it. Okay, so Luke's writing it because that's the whole thing about the week. Luke is a, is a uh, Gentile physician, but he's using the Hebrew calendar to mark the time, which says a couple of things. One thing that it says is that Paul, in law likelihood, even though Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and started the Gentile church and made sure that Gentiles didn't have to follow Judaism, he still observed in many ways his Jewishness, you know. So, so he was still recognizing the feasts. It also sort of says that the feasts are still in play because, you know, the feasts are prophetic. And so Pentecost was the birth of the church. And we're waiting for Yom Kippur, which is, there'll be Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, and then Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, and then Sukkot, the uh, tabernacles, uh, because we're going to hear Trump. Remember, there's a lot of things. I'm not talking about President Trump right now. We're going to hear a trumpet, you know, a last Trump kind of thing. And the dead in Christ rise. Remember all that? So that's Rosh Hashanah. Fulfillment of Rosh Hashanah. Yes, okay. And then there'll be a judgment. There'll be a judgment that takes place. Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And then we will live face to face with the Lord forever. Tabernacles. Right? So all that's prophetic. So we're still in this whole time thing that the Lord set out with the festivals. Um, so they're marking, it has to be at least because it's after the Day of Atonement. I think I read somebody uh, went back and their best guess was Day of Atonement was early October that year. And so it's after that. So they're into mid or late October by the time this is taking place. So you're getting into the area close to the November 11th, the scene of suicide. So Paul warned them. Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot, which is the captain of the ship and the owner of the ship. So they're going to press on and the centurion decides they're going to go on the ship. This, this word for warning them is a word that basically is a superior giving a command to an inferior, like in the military. So when it says Paul warned them, in the Greek it's giving you the idea that Paul is in charge of this whole venture, not the owner of the ship, not the captain of the ship, not the centurion. Paul is in charge. Because Paul is the one that's on mission. And so when it says he warns them, he, he gave an edict. He decreed something that they ignored. So, so here's, here's a possibility. Possibly Paul knew this from experience. Because when you go to, to I think it's 1 Corinthians 11 or so, he goes through, he was in three shipwrecks. He spent one whole night drifting in the sea. So Paul could have just by experience said, guys, this is a bad idea. Just, just the wisdom of having been there, done that, and survived three of them, <laughs> just saying, you don't want to do this. But more than likely, because it's saying that Paul sort of had authority and was telling them something in authority, Probably it was a word from the Lord. Probably it was a, a word of knowledge or a prophetic thing about what was going to take place if they tried to go and what was going to end up protecting everybody on that ship. And in a minute, we'll see there were 276 on board. What saved the lives of 275 other people is the fact they were with Paul. Because Paul's on mission. And what the Lord calls you to do, he's going to make sure he gets you there. If you're faithful in doing it, right? He's going to resource you for it if he called you to do it, right? It's on him 
because it's his mission. And he's put Paul on a mission to see Caesar. And so, uh, so Paul speaks with authority, and, and Julius decides to go with the ship owner and the ship captain. And he's trying to get there as quick as possible. And, and so he's going to take the risk and go. So that's 10 and 11. Uh, verse 12 says, Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix. Well, that's a nice one, isn't it? Phoenix and winter there. Probably not Arizona, right? Not many seas close to Phoenix and Arizona, I wouldn't think. But winter there, this was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. Um, what's going to take place here, and this is considered one of the finest descriptions of a sea voyage in ancient literature because of the details of what took place during the storm and where they were and the way they were trying to go. They were hopping through islands. I don't know if y'all remember, Angie did a sermon where she talked about the Lord giving her the word parabolic, and that word was about doing these little jaunts, which is what's the description in Greek of them trying to go island to island to let the islands protect them as they try to work their way up to Rome. Um, but, but anyhow, this particular harbor is unsuitable, so they decide to take a vote. Uh, I think I mentioned this Wednesday night. I don't, maybe it was last Sunday, but um, somebody recently saw me in a restaurant and asked me if we voted on things. I said, no, we don't vote on things. Votes go poorly in Scripture. Here's an example right here. They took a vote. Paul said, don't go. They voted and they went. Right? Right. You don't vote when it comes to hearing from God. Amen. You get everybody to hear from God and get on the same page, right? That's what you do. God's in charge. And if God's in charge, it's not a democracy, it's a theocracy. God's in charge. God's king. And God loves us and he wants to tell us and we can hear from God. My sheep know my voice, right? So no, you don't vote on things. That's, that's good because there is a pattern. The ecclesia is a free citizen. That's the metaphor. A free citizen of a free city-state in Greek and Roman idea, and that is the ecclesia, but Jesus is in charge, right? So, so you don't just have a vote. Because stuff like this happens, and then Paul has to pull you out because you voted. So, so it goes on, 13 and 14, a gentle south wind, there's that thing enticing you to go. Oh, yeah, this is a good idea. Look at this. It's a gentle south wind began to blow. They saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force, that's something we know about here in eastern North Carolina, called a nor'easter, swept down from the island. And suddenly it's, uh-oh. You can hear Popeye the sailor going, uh-oh. Is there plenty of spinach on board? <laughs> 18 and 20, we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. Now, I've skipped some, but it's just going through the details of the storm they've caught in. The storm is driving them along. They're, they're not steering anything. The storm is driving them. So on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days because the storm's just raging, and the storm, oh, there you go, on cue, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Except for Paul, right? Yeah. Right, right, because Paul's got a word from the Lord, right? Yeah. He knows he's going to see Caesar. But, but Luke, Luke is having to travel on Paul's word, right? Luke's a little less sure. We all gave up hope. But Paul's got his own word. Paul's sure. 
gave up all hope of being saved. Verse 21, after they had gone a long time without food, so it's continuing on down, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice. <laughs> I wonder if Paul was an eldest child. <laughs> Looking at the rest of the siblings and saying, you should have done what I told you because mom and dad are going to be here any time now and what are we going to do about this? Because I'm not getting in trouble for y'all. There you go. And so uh, if you want to know what your brother's like, that's what he's about, right? <laughs> that's so your brother. And so after they had gone a long time, they've got this thing, and Paul stands up and says, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Now, this is not him rubbing his noses in it, their noses in it. It sounds like it. But what he's doing is he's standing up to remind them that he's got a word from the Lord, that they need to listen to him. If they want to live, they need to listen to Paul. So he's reminding them, when all this started, before they had their big vote, right? Before they had their big vote, Paul said, no, don't do it. And then they had their big vote, and now they're in, well, I'll, let me change my words. Now they're in a bind. And so... Uh, so he said, you would have spared yourselves damage and loss. They've already lost all kinds of stuff, already uh, taken on all kinds of damages. So 22 and 23, but now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost, which is why he's reminding them. He's telling them prophetically, you're going to live. Remember, Luke's already said they're hopeless. They feel hopeless and helpless. You know what that is? Suicidal. When there's no hope and there's no help. And I've already told you, they said after November 11th, it was suicidal to be out there. So that was, that was the pinch they're in. No hope. And Paul stands up and says, remember, I said we shouldn't come, but take courage. Not one of you will be lost. The ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. Just more, more of, it's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And we're here in the scene doing our thing to advance the kingdom. And in the unseen, corresponding with us and assisting us are angelic warriors. So that in the seen and the unseen, the kingdom of Jesus Christ is advancing. And they're here to assist. They're here to assist, right? Amen. So the angel comes, stands beside Paul, gives him this message that everybody will live if they do what he's saying. Said, don't be afraid, Paul, because look, the Lord's given you a word. You've got to stand trial before Caesar. You're going to Caesar. That's the reason for the mission. You're on the way to Caesar. You have a divine appointment. And guess what? When Paul stands in front of Caesar, guess who's in charge? Paul. When Jesus stood before Pilate, Jesus was in charge. When the apostles stood before the Sanhedrin, the apostles were in charge. You're in charge. You're in charge. You are in charge. Of course, the critical component in you being in charge is you hearing from the Lord. Because Danny's not going to be in charge if Danny's on a word of Danny's. And Danny's not going to be in, in charge if I've heard from the Lord, but I've got mixture in it. But if I'm standing on a true word from the Lord, I'm in charge. Because the word of the Lord is going to take place. Right? Right? So Paul's on the way to Caesar. He's got a divine appointment with Caesar. So the angel says, don't be afraid, Paul. You've got to stand trial. You've got this appointment that you're going to make. And God has graciously given you as a gift, Paul, because you're the one that I've made this a divine appointment. But as a gift to you, I'm going to give you the lives of everybody else. I'm going to enlarge my protection from you over 275 other people. They're going to live because of you and your relationship to me. 
there are people around you who get favor because of you. Because of the favor on your life, you bring favor to other people. You bring protection to other people. You're covering to people you don't even realize you're covering. So keep up your courage, men. He's talking. So look, think about this. Paul's there talking. So, so in their eyes, think about it. In their eyes, Paul's this educated tent maker. Very high education. Great many degrees. Who's given all that up to be a preacher. Right? And they are seasoned sailors and Roman soldiers in charge of prisoners. He's talking to seafaring sailors, seasoned and experienced, and he's talking to Roman soldiers in charge of him. And he's telling them, here's the word of the Lord. Take courage. Because their knees were knocking. Right? Right? Their guts were wrenched. So, the Lord has graciously given the lives of everybody on board to Paul as a gift. Keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. So he said it's very clearly, stick with me, do what I say, you'll all live, but this ship is going down. This ship is lost, but you're going to be saved. Good? Skip into 30 and 31. In an attempt to escape from the ship, these seasoned sailors, <laughs> the seasoned sailors said, you know, I've seen this before. I think we're better off in the lifeboat. <laughs> they were pretending, typically back then, it's not like lifeboats today. Typically back then they had a, a a smaller vessel that trailed behind the larger vessel. And they used it for like maneuvering as they were docking and doing different things. And uh, that was also the lifeboat. And they, at one point in the story, they had pulled that thing up and tied it off on the vessel itself. And so now these sailors are letting the lifeboat down into the sea. Look, pretending they were going to lower some anchors for the, from the bow, but they're really getting them this boat. And Paul says to Julius, the centurion, and the soldiers, if these men don't stay on board, I can't save all y'all. All bets are off. Because I had a word from the Lord. The word from the Lord is everybody do what I say, stick together, and everybody will be saved. But if these guys are going to venture out, that throws everything off because we're disobeying the word of the Lord. Right? Julius doesn't check with the sailors or the owner or the captain. Julius gives an order and they cut the ropes on that lifeboat. <laughs> Which I'm sure the, uh, the sailors are very happy about. You know, right? So, uh, so the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. <laughs> Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat for the last 14 days. So they've been two weeks. You've been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Verse 34 and 35, now I urge you to take some food. You'll need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. And after he said this, he took some bread, gave thanks to God in front of them all. He broke it and began to eat. Now, this is a meal, but this is definitely like communion language. Paul is taking communion in front, of, in front of them. This is, you know, we talk about the Last Supper. Just, this is the Last Supper. Because this is the last time they're going to eat before this ship is gone. So this is literally a Last Supper. And as a part of that, Paul is, Paul is having communion as a part of that meal. And so everybody eats their fill to get whatever strength they can. Uh, 36 through 38, they're all encouraged. They eat. All together, there were 276. Some of you may have like 76 or different numbers, but most manuscripts, 276 uh, on board 
when they eaten as many as they had, as much as they had wanted, they actually lightened the ship by throwing the rest of the grain into the sea. And then 39, oh, no more, no more, that's it, okay. Well, it goes on after this, it gets to a place that the soldiers are going to kill the prisoners because they don't want to be responsible when they abandon ship. If they lose any of those prisoners, you know, you die. You, you die if you lose your prisoner. We've already seen this in some of our angel stories. And Julia steps in again because of Paul. Because he loves Paul. He steps in and says, no, I believe they'll all get to shore and everybody's going to be okay and we won't lose anybody. So he prevents the soldiers from killing all the prisoners. And they do end up on shore and that's the whole story. But what I want to just uh, focus on for a second, besides the fact that we have angels supporting us in our ministry, in the unseen realm, corresponding to us in the seen, here's, here's just something for you. It's an easy metaphor. It's an easy parable. Many times the seas are seen as the abyss. The seas are also seen as the nations. The nations are troubled. Economic rulers, the ship owner, economic businesses, businessmen, sailors on a vessel to do business, civil authorities for nations, Roman soldiers get tossed around by all kinds of politics and all kinds of trouble that stir the nations. But the one person who's not tossed is the one who's walking on the word of the Lord. The one person who has true authority in the midst of all the trouble is the person hearing from God. See any parallels? We live in a troubled world. We're not to be troubled. The nations are in an uproar. We don't need to be in an uproar. Civil authorities and economic authorities don't know what's going on. And they're helpless to do anything of any true impact. And in fact, they have agendas that don't go with our agenda. And many times, their own agenda will be the death of them. But if we have a word from the Lord, we're in charge. And we have authority. And we can stabilize and save people that are caught up in all the trouble. You see that? Yes. Yes. It's, a, it's a parable. The experience Paul had is a parable for today. There's trouble on every hand. It seems like there's no hope. It seems like it's going to end in disaster. And the truth is, some man-made stuff is going down. But if you stick with the word of the Lord, everybody is saved even some of the people responsible for the trouble. Let me say that one more time. Even some of the people who are responsible for the trouble are saved. Because we serve a God who's merciful and wants everybody saved. And Jesus paid a very dear price for everybody. Whether you're just a little bit lost or you're really big lost. Some of us are just a little bit lost. 
But you know, I can't get past my little bit. You know, you asked me my testimony. I grew up with people who believed, and I believed my whole life, and I would not have been saved without believing, even though it's just a little bit. And there are some people that are big-time prodigals who had all kinds of gallivanting involved. And they're saved the same way I was saved. And the gap between Jesus and where we were does not matter. It was a gap. And he's the only one that could bridge that gap. Whether it was a little gap or a big gap. Whether you're trying to get across a ditch you can't jump across or whether you're looking at you know, there's a big hole out in Arizona somewhere. You, you ever heard of that big hole? It's a grand big hole. <laughs> Either way, regardless of the hole in front of you, Jesus is the one that can get you across. And so there are going to be some people in the midst of what's taking place and the trouble right now that are standing in a Grand Canyon and they're going to be bridged over. And we don't need to be elder brothers and get all upset about it because that shows what's going on in our hearts. We need to rejoice that people get saved. Need to be praying for people that are responsible for some of the trouble that they'll get saved. Good? Yes. Good. I'm glad you agree. That's very, it makes it easy. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that, but I, I brought something with me that I think will encourage you. For those of you who are on intercessors, I've just been printing a paragraph the past few days. Each day I print a paragraph because it's such a long word that it's real easy to just get overwhelmed and lost in it. When you have a really long word, you can't rejoice at all the things you would rejoice with because you just get overwhelmed with how much it is. And so... so uh, there have been three good paragraphs I've put on intercessors, but there's a whole bunch here, and I'm going to read it to you. So this is from a lady named Jamie Rohrbach, who's from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And this was on the Elijah list on November 10th. So it was on the Elijah list last Wednesday, right? Recently, I heard the Lord say, November is a month of turnaround. He then gave me the following scriptures. But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Psalm 10, 14. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Psalm 10, 17 through 18. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. Psalm 12, 5. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Psalm 14, verse 7. The Lord says to you today, November is a month of turnaround for you. For so long you have humbled yourself and cried out to me to hear and answer. I tell you that your prayers have not been wasted. I have heard every tear and every prayer has been stored up in my bosom. I take your prayers personally. I have a personal interest in everything that happens to you. For you are my beloved child. I'll do anything for you. I've given you land and children a hundredfold with more to come. And you are walking in more now than you ever dreamed. But I have so much more for you. Where you are now is only the beginning. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Mark 10, verses 29 and 30. And, uh, here's a paragraph that I've given on intercessors. 
Do not fear, my child, for it is my good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Take your hands off the things you've been clinging to and let me show you what I can do with them. Invite me to work with your pain, work your pain out for your good this month. For I say to you now that November is your month of turnaround. In November, I will be working things out for your good, and the goodness of my turnaround will become obvious. I've raised you up in, a, in secret, but I am getting ready to flaunt you to the world as my treasure, my delight, and my beloved. No one except for me has seen you at any time, not truly, not the way I see you. But in November, I am lifting the veil off the eyes of the people around you, and I will show you what I have in store. Here's another paragraph I put on intercessors. In November, in a good way, hidden things will become public and public things will be forgotten. This month will be the month of my turnaround and of my heap it up. I will heap your rewards on you. You will be the object of my blessing. I'm bringing you into a good land of brooks and springs and fountains of water. It's a little overwhelming, isn't it? That's only a third of it. Sort of hard to put all that on intercessors. This month, you will find yourself migrating toward your future. You will move toward your prosperity by valuing yourself the way I value you. Your faith will arise and come up to meet the level of my expectations for your life. In November, you will find yourself recompensed. Hear that, Grace? Got to read that again. In November, you will find yourself recompensed and rewarded for things which only I have seen. You have responded rightly when others have not. You've been faithful and a faithful steward. You have known in whom you have believed, and you have known that I am able to keep that which you've committed to me. In November, you will find more paths converging I have placed you into a rushing river of my spirit's flow. You will not be denied this river you have asked for. Years ago, you saw this river. Years ago, you saw yourself moving on it. But you did not have the paradigm at that time to understand what I was saying to you. Now you will understand. All your dreams about rivers will converge even more in November. You already experienced one convergence in October, but I tell you, there are more. Multiple rivers are flowing toward you right now, and you are rushing toward them on the flow of my spirit. When you converge with my rivers, it will make quite a splash. Those of you who listen to Dutch Sheets know that there was a prophetic dream he just went through. They were in the valley of the streams, and all these streams were coming together. And he dredged them so that they all flowed together freely. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. You will delight in splashing of my rivers this month, says the Lord. You will enjoy what I've promised you. My promises are not in vain. Did you think they were? I had to bide my time to get the manifestations of my word to you. But indeed, now I'm coming quickly. Think not that things are lost to you. You were simply biding your time until you got close enough to my river to converge with the blessings I've had for you all along. Blessings which I laid up for you before time began. All things are yours. For you are mine and I am yours. You have an inheritance which is beyond the reach of change. It is stored up, incorruptible for you. Nothing can steal it. No one can take it from you. Thank me for releasing you into it, and now you can prosper in ways you could not have prospered before. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed 
with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory, Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. Your dreams are not too big for me. I am sending you helpers, and your uh-oh, and your helpers will pull more out of you than you ever imagined. Your helpers are heaven sent. I sent them myself, and I will send more. You will work together to accomplish my purposes. For great is your task on the earth. You will finish your task, says the Lord. I say it again, you will finish your task. He continued, you are not too old. I want to say that again too. You are not too old. Not too tired. Not too anything to do what I've called you to do. Indeed, I'm giving you rest. I'm bringing you into a wide place, a safe place, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains, and of springs. I'm taking care of you. I go before you to prepare the way. And here's a paragraph I put on intercessors. I will open doors before you that no one could open this month. I am the great door opener. I'm going to work on your behalf, even now as I speak, to open doors for you that no man can open. No man can open them, but I am not a man. I can open every door for you, and I tell you that you will be surprised and shocked at the doors I am opening for you right now. Try me and see. Get to know me and my DNA. Know me and my heart toward you. Put a draw and a demand on me and my heart toward you. My love for you is vast. It is almost incomprehensible, but indeed you will know it. I am ministering my love to you right now in ways that you need, ways you thought were not possible, ways you did not think to ask for. Ask me this month to help you receive my love and all it contains. You will not even know what you are asking, but I know, and I need you to ask it. I have more for you than you can imagine. I love that we can ask and not even know what we're asking for, but he knows and he grants. That's cool. In November, you will see a convergence of even more rivers, for I am redeeming your past. Say hello to your future. Right now, your future is bright, but I had to remove some things from you and remove you from some things. However, you are ready to walk forward now. In November, you will see some things happen that you could not have dreamed. I will turn it around for you in November, says the Lord. Indeed, I will turn it around. It's a long word. It's a good word. And it's all about November. Kim Clement talked about a November to remember. Wow. Could this be the November to remember? And she's got a prayer. Jamie Rohrbach has a prayer to pray into this. So I'm just going to read this prayer, and you can can, uh, agree with it if you like. Father God, I receive it. I take this word unto myself, and I thank you for it. Abba, Father, please help me receive your love and all it contains. Thank you for my future. I say hello to it now. Thank you for working all things out for my good. Thank you for turning things around for me. Father God, please help me to stay on your straight and narrow path while you work all the while on my behalf. Help me to stay immersed in the river of your spirit while you move me into everything you have for me. Thank you, Holy Abba, Father. In Jesus' mighty and precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. It's a good word. It's a good word. And I like one reason. I had two reasons for reading it, maybe three. One reason was it's November. One reason was 
we're going to have some helpers that come and help us, and they're heaven sent, and it sounds like they're angelic, which goes with our series. And the third reason is I just like it. <laughs> it bears witness to me. So uh, I hope it bore witness to you. The praise team can come up. You have more authority than you realize, and you command angels. That's hard to get your mind around, doesn't it? Mm. Don't ever want to be an angel. You command angels. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if y'all could hear that. Amanda was like, that's right. <laughs> She knows she commands angels because she commands a Marine. <laughs> Is everybody saved? Everybody saved. Everybody know the Lord? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Said easy making a confession to somebody. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of the living God, my Abba, my Father. And Jesus is the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he's the Lord of Lords. No one can be called master in his presence. He is the master commander and king of kings of everywhere, of all time. Can't go any, any place in history that he's not king. Beginning or end, he's king. In the vastness of space, he's king. In the middle of the deepest cavern, he's king. King of glory king of the universe that's cool well we're going to meet around the Lord's table now so I'm going to pray Lord thank you for the bread and the cup thank you for teaching us to eat and drink and remember what you've done for us meet with us while we do this make us keenly aware that by your stripes we were healed and that you have given us life through this redemption, forever life. Meet with us and speak to us as we eat and drink, Lord, corporately and individually. And we pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen.